Hello, I'm Irina Kiptiko, and let's start our discussion. We are going to talk about a very exciting technology. Um, the technology that is transforming businesses and even our lives. So the, the topic is robotic process automation or RPA, uh, the next chapter in the automation story. Uh, we have two analysts working in the customer experience field and two IBA experts as our guests. And I would like to would like to introduce the panelists. Mark Hillary is a British technology writer and analyst based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Mark contributes to the global media focused on technology and has written several books on technology. Mark advises national governments on technology policies and has advised the United Nations on the use of technology for development. Peter Ryan is one of the foremost experts in customer relationship management. Peter received numerous prestigious awards in the custom experience field and is included in each iteration of the Nearshore America's Power 50 influences listings. In cooperation, the knowledge executive a specialized research and media host working with C-level executives, Peter conducts annual vendor surveys to identify top offshore customer experience delivery points. This year, South Africa was selected as a top BPO destination. Therefore, we are going to discuss RPA in South Africa as a part of the generic RPA topic. And I invite Dmitry Denisuk, Managing Director at IBA South Africa to help us explore the topic. Steph S. Lobich, a project manager at IBA Group, uh, will share a technical perspective on RPA based on his many year experience in RPA project. So I'd like to introduce the first discussion topic. Uh, what are the benefits of RPA? Mark, if I could hand over to you, are you ready to answer? That would be great. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Irina. Um, well, I think that uh, we've, we've known about automation systems for a long time. We, we've seen workflow automation, but, but what's really kind of changed with RPA is um, the ease of um, creating the, the automated workflows. So, you know, it's very much focused on using a, a graphical user interface to, to train the agent um, or the, the, the bot um, in what needs to be automated. So, so that, that's one of the big differences here, that it's much more simple now. Um, and really the business benefit is around um, reducing repetition, reducing mundane workflows, um, where, where I'm often writing about the, the customer service, customer experience space, we see contact center agents that are often using multiple systems and transferring customer information from one system to another. Um, and, you know, traditionally, this has been quite a, quite a manual, mundane, repetitive process. There's the potential for introducing errors. So, so you're not only automating tasks and making it faster and simpler and easier, um, but you're also reducing the possibility of introducing errors as well. So, so there's, there's multiple benefits. Okay, thank you, Mark. And how about you, Peter? What, what are the benefits of RP? But um, before this, please tell us about the story that you conduct, the BPO destination of the year. Why is South, South Africa the best one this year? Well, I... Arena, it was it was selected as the most favored offshore location by enterprise customer experience buyers. And I think there was a number of reasons. One, they've been very active and very aggressive in their promotion to the key demand markets, i.e. the United Kingdom, North America, and Australia, New Zealand. That's one reason. I think another reason is the fact that there is a very strong reputation for quality in South Africa, quality labor force, the willingness of the agents to be problem solvers and to go the extra mile, and certainly a great, I think, cultural and linguistic affinity with the consumers that they tend to support. Now, in terms of your question around the benefits of RPA, I think that Mark laid it out very, very nicely. I would say that from my perspective, what I've been observing the length of time I've been in the contact center and the customer experience space has been uh, automation has had a series of stops and starts. 
when I first got into this game in 2003, 2004, there was talk that automation was going to kill the call center. It was going to get rid of all the agents and that everything was going to be automated. But very quickly, we saw that the technologies were being deployed too aggressively without being stress tested properly. And it sort of went into hibernation. It's had a rebirth of sorts over the past several years. And I think with very good validation too, the, the solutions are much more much more apropos, they're, they're much more realistic. And I think the key, the benefit that, that we're seeing it bring to the table now is it's taking the mundaneness of an agent interaction, at least in the initial stages, out of a telephone call or a digital interaction. And what it's doing is it's helping the workflow move a lot more quickly and a lot more efficiently. So by the time you get to an agent, if you need to get to an agent after going through the automated interface, uh, there's a much better chance that your issue will be resolved in a more expeditious fashion. From the standpoint of automation, where it's going, I think that there's been some great strides, especially with the implementation of artificial intelligence and drawing that into the ability for automation to be able to interact more seamlessly. Um, but the development continues. And I think that the benefits are going to be seen for some time, especially as the competition in terms of the developers that are bringing the new solutions to the forefront, improve their solutions and make them even more customer ready. Thank you, Peter. And over to you, Dmitry. Uh, so what are the benefits of um, RPA? As, uh, is there any specifics of RPA implementation in South Africa? Um, no, in general, um, as Mark and Peter already talked about, some of the obvious uh, benefits that are even less uh, obvious, uh, less obvious benefits that RPA can bring, for instance, um, reducing the risk. Because um, otherwise, you, you would need probably to. Um, um, integrate two business applications and this is impact and the risk of uh, on the existing environment. While RPA projects are generally are low risk and um, let me call them non-invasive and they don't disturb uh, existing systems. Or another non-obvious benefit is uh, like minim uh, minimizing exposure to sensitive data. Because now the robot works with the documents that may contain some private or sensitive data instead of human. So there is less, um, less risk of uh, exposure to this data. Okay, thank you, Dmitry. And Sergey, maybe you can add something about the technical perspective of RPA benefits. Technical perspective, it's, uh, <laughs> well, uh, everybody already said many, many uh, actual RPA benefits. And uh, I would like to add that there is, so we all think of RPA of as a tool to improve some existing business processes and uh, uh, make them better, smoother, but, uh, Actually, that technology also allows to uh, to introduce a brand new customer experience. So, it's like uh, because uh, it is faster than uh, usual processing that you, than usual human processing. So, in the cases when uh, customer uh, when the usual business process would be submit a request and then uh, after some time uh, come with a response uh, that could be implemented uh, on the same time, uh, I mean, in, in real time. So with a short uh, waiting time, uh, which is uh, measured in seconds instead of hours. So, um, that is also a great benefit that well technology can provide. Okay, I see. Thank you, Sergey. Um, some companies complain that RPA is costly. Let's talk about the total cost of ownership um, in relation to RPA. How do we make it lower? Peter, can you please start? Oh, sorry, Mark. I think that sure. No, it's it's okay. 
It's okay. Um, I think that the, the TCO discussion around RPA is one that, that has been lingering for a long time, but I would put it like this. When you, when you find a good RPA system, one that works really well, one that has stress tested and proves watertight, it'll pay for itself very quickly in terms of being able to route customer interactions in terms of being able to solve intera some interactions up front. And it, effectively what that means is that you're reducing the need for the human element. And what we know, Arena, is, and I'm sure Mark can back this up, that roughly speaking, the human element in a contact center accounts for 70 to 75% of cost, depending on the location that you might be in. Now, when you factor the opportunity of taking the human element out of the contact center and being able to replace some of that with an RPA solution that certainly might have an upfront capital cost, but will be significantly lower over the long term, uh, I really believe that that's a very compelling economic argument for deploying the solution. But the key here is to make sure that it's going to be an efficient solution, one that's going to work well, one that will obviously need tweaking and updating, but one that you can count on to get the job done. That will be a very cost-effective play over the long term. Thank you, Peter. And over to you, Mark. Yeah, I would just say that, um, and, it, and it probably goes to, to Sergey, um, that about half of the TCO is actually probably your, your development and deployment of the system itself. You know, you, you have ongoing licensing and maintenance costs afterwards, but, but you know, you, 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 the, the biggest chunk is to create it in the first place. So I guess um, working with your... Um, uh, the, the, the company that's implementing the system for you and helping you to find the the best vendor. Um, you know, this kind of investment upfront in finding a great partner, um, well, like IBA Group, for example. Uh, you know, th but th this really does uh, impact massively on the total cost of, of an RPA project. Thank you, Mark. Maybe Sergey, because we've mentioned it's a technical perspective already. <laughs> Yes, I'm, as uh, Mark said, I am usually on another side. I am one of the line is in this uh, total cost of ownership, uh, one of the expenses line. And uh, what I can say, uh, maybe it's close to what Peter said, but uh, when we are talking about total cost of ownership and we are saying that it is high, we always compare it with uh, economical, well, with the business benefits we get from uh, RPA uh, implementation. And uh, if uh, that, uh, well, that cost is uh, uh, not much less, not less than uh, the benefits, that means probably, uh, well, as the business processes which were implemented, automated, are not picked correctly, maybe they are not. Uh, um, well, well, yes, yeah, uh, uh, they are not uh, optimized enough or mm -hmm. good enough to be automated. And uh, uh, well, so my my idea, what what I wanted to say is that. Uh, uh, for good implementation. Since should we choose to make the TCO lower? I mean, the process we choose for automation. Well, you should not think about having the total cost of ownership lower. You should think about making uh, business benefits minus total cost of ownership bigger. So okay, yes. always try to focus on that and uh, not on just minimizing total cost of ownership. Okay, thank you, Sergey. And over to you, Dmitry. Um, yeah, I agree with uh, what uh, you already said. I can just add that the total cost of ownership consists of uh, uh, multiple uh, elements or factors. It's uh, license fees, then development costs, then center of excellence, then operating costs, including OCR, optical character recognition, and uh, maintenance of the platform. And also I can add uh, business process maintenance. 
So, and if you are looking to reduce or make it lower, then you need to analyze each of those uh, elements, each of those factors and see what can be done uh, there. So it's uh, like a holistic approach. Um, for instance, license fees, um, you can compare what uh, different vendors provide or even go for um, uh, platform with uh, zero license fees or uh, operating costs. Some, uh, some OCR tools, they have um, pay per use model, means the more documents you scan or recognize, the, the, the more you pay. But there are also uh, open source uh, engines. So it's really like a holistic approach. I see a complicated thing. Um, so uh, we at IB advocate, advocate for a pro developer approach to RPE. Some companies stand for citizen developers. So, um, what would you say is best, citizen developers or professional developers in relation to IPE? Uh, can you, Mark, can you start, please? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Well, I mean, I think this this really depends on um, the kind of policies you've got within your organization, um, how you control uh, source code, for example. Um, I mean, clearly, I do think that in general, we are moving towards an environment where professionals outside of the IT industry will need some sort of basic understanding of um, tools like um, how to code a basic automation system. Uh, so, you know, we can imagine uh, a future world where lawyers, accountants, doctors, um, you know, they, they can learn how to automate processes um, that they previously couldn't have. But, but clearly you, ha you have the problem of um, source code control. I mean, if you have a big enterprise uh, and you've rolled out a system, and then everybody in the company can just tinker around and play with it, then, then clearly that can introduce problems. So, so yeah, so it's a question of balance, um, how, how you control um, the system that's being used. Thank you, Mark. And what do you think, Peter? I, I really couldn't disagree with what Mark said. I think that it's, it's great to have a robust team of people who have got their own ideas in terms of how development has to go forward. That's how we've seen some of the best innovations in technology over the course of the past two or three decades. And some of the huge leaps forward that, that we've uh, all experienced is business people and consumers. At the same time, I think Mark is bang on in the sense that unless there is some overriding control in regards to how a community of developers is going to tinker and tweak around the edges, that could introduce more problems. So certainly encouraging innovation, encouraging trying new things is, is absolutely essential, but making sure that there is some level of coordination is going to also be imperative. Thank you, Peter. And over to you, Dmitry. Um, I would personally also go for pro developer approach because for citizen developer, uh, developing of bots um, or, or automating the processes, it's not the main task. So his or her focus will be shifted to like main duties. Well, for pro developer, it's a main a primary task. And moreover, the pro developer has more experience, obviously. So the bots created by the pro developer will be more like uh, reliable or easy to maintain and with uh, less uh, error prone. So I would say those are the pro for pro developer. Okay, I see, thank you. And Sergey, can you please add something? Well, I'm a little bit an interested party here. <laughs> so uh, I am uh, on the developer side. I can see benefits for both approaches. Uh, and uh, actually the main benefit in uh, citizen developer I can see is that uh, it is very fast. So if uh, one uh, business person does know the business problem and can uh, do programming, then he can create his bot in, I don't know, several days, maybe maybe even hours, if it is a simple bot. And you will never get that speed with 
well, separate developers, you will need to get, uh, uh, well, solution design, uh, budget, uh, time allocation, and uh, so th that is slower. But uh, uh, to advocate professional developers, uh, all that steps are still required. Because when you create a good solution design, you usually ask some questions which you may not think about uh, previously, and that questions or answers to that questions could change the automation dramatically. So instead of doing something very fast, uh, you do the right thing slower. And uh, well, I think the, <laughs> the second is better. <laughs> Okay. And how about centers of excellence? <clears throat> Are they really needed? And if yes, should they be in-house or external? Mark, can you start? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, what we're talking about here is um, changing the culture of an organization. You know, if, if, if you're the CFO and you can see the potential for the organization of automating many individual processes, um, then, then you need a way to demonstrate that across the entire enterprise. So, so I think that you definitely um, need a center of excellence to, to demonstrate the value of RPA. Um, personally, I, I would think that um, it could work internally or externally, but if you're going to do it externally, then you need to have a, again, like I was saying about the implementation, I mean, you need a partner that you can rely on and, and maybe not like an independent partner, not a partner that is tied to one particular RPA vendor, for example. So, um, you know, if you've got a great partner, then you could do this externally. Otherwise, you know, clearly it's a kind of evangelism role within the organization to, to show people what's possible. Okay, thank you, Mark. And uh, according to your view, Peter, are centers of excellence needed? I think that some of the best innovations we've seen have come out of centers of excellence. And one of the things that I'm encouraged at, especially as I visit my friends in the CX technology industry, is to see so often that they have set up their own centers of excellence, their own laboratories in which they go out, they, they hypothesize, they construct, they test. And if it works great, if it doesn't, they start over. But the reality is if you can have centers that are going to spend their entire time and, and are dedicated to developing the best possible solutions, whether it's automation or otherwise, I don't see anything wrong with that. I definitely agree with Mark that you should not exclude the possibility of working with outside parties, uh, partners that are in a position to bring perhaps solutions that the organization, the contracting organization might not have thought of that they can bring these to the table using an external organization. Uh, that, that certainly has a great deal of merit in regards to making sure that a client gets the best possible technology that they're looking for that's going to help them innovate, that's gonna help them position themselves more competitively. But the reality is, the only way that industry is going to move forward in automation or any other aspect of a technical solution is by developing that, that critical mass around thought leadership, trying new ideas, going out, making sure that these ideas are, are given as much scrutiny as possible. And if they work, take them out as aggressively as you can, implement them as aggressively as you can. And if they don't, figure out what didn't work and then start afresh. Thank you, Peter. Mitri, maybe you can add about the uh, centers of excellence in South Africa? Um, yeah. Um... I think it's a uh, like continuing uh, discussion for like a pro and uh, citizen developer. And regardless if we have business user or uh, professional developers who create support to maybe automate some business process. And the question is who will own this bot? I mean, who will um, document it and maintain? Because in the future, if a business application will change the screen, this bot will stop working. So someone need to fix it. And um, I believe that the bots should not be owned by individual okay, business users or pro developers, but it should, they should be owned by organization itself. So therefore organization needs some 
unit which will uh, own those boats and uh, will govern them, them and uh, do all the maintenance and document them. And it will have maybe some guidelines and standard in place that all the boats should, uh, all the new developments should follow. So therefore, I think uh, the COE is definitely needed in organizations. And about if it's, uh, it's better to have external or in-house. Um, I think it's uh, there is a mixture in the organization. They can have hybrid at center of excellence. That means some of the uh, employees are in-house and some of from vendor or uh, external partner. And um, in South Africa, well, it's the, you know, like a standard, so each organization should work out own way. Uh, I know that one big uh, telecommunication group of companies, South Africa and Southern Africa, they have around like 80 employees in house of the, in the uh, center of excellence and around about 20 are external. So this is like 80 to 20 proportion. But again, this is not a rule. Uh, each organization should uh, check what best works for it. Thank you, Dmitry and Sergey. Can you share your experience of the uh, centers of excellence? Well, uh, my understanding sorry, of sorry, I'm running out of time. <laughs> Let me make it short. Uh, so. Uh, when we are talking about center of excellence, we should not think about a fixed structure. It's an evolution in, and in the very beginning of that evolution, it is very reasonable to involve some external vendors uh, who will bring their expertise to help uh, set up it fast and to, uh, well, to, uh, minimal required uh, level, but then uh, it, ideally, I think each organization should uh, be uh, heading, should try to make it uh, in-house, um, so to have uh, in-house uh, center of excellence. Uh, I like the idea of hybrid center of excellence, like when you have uh, many, uh, well, some people in center of excellence in-house and some are uh, offshore uh, developers um, that uh, that should work and uh, that is per perfectly, perfectly fine. But, uh, well, to my understanding, somebody should be always in-house. Okay, thank you, Sergey. And the last question, how is, is RPA going to develop? Um, please express your view. Uh, Mark, can you please? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I, I mean, I think that we, we see a, a difference um, between attended and unattended RPA um, and the complexity of something Something that's simple for a human, like looking at a document and understanding the information there is actually quite a complex process. You know, you need to digitize the document. You need to extract all of the information. You need to validate whether it makes any sense. Um, is it correct? Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the development as we move forward will be in the, in the area of AI and, and machine learning and, um, being able to um, do those kind of things that are simple for a human when you're attending the RPA session and training a bot um, so that more of it can actually be um, unattended, um, you know, more, more intelligent systems able to uh, lear learn from uh, repeated processes. Thank you, Mark. And your view, Peter? Everything Mark said, I think is bang on. I think there's going to be a lot more development in, in terms of that unattended element and the ability to learn from what previous tasks have been. Equally, I think that it's going to be a lot more straightforward. I think that the automation is going to be a lot more straightforward for the not just the individuals that implement the solutions for a client, but also those who manage them. I think they're going to be a lot more intuitive, a lot more user-friendly to the point where somebody 
who perhaps doesn't have a great development or technology background will be in a position to administer them. And I also think that we're going to see those smart solutions that Mark referred to become much more customer friendly. And I think we're going to see the, the basic automated solutions that are handling customer management queries right now become much more complex in terms of the type of interactions they're able to, to drive, which is going to benefit everybody. Um, thank you, Peter. And over to you, Dmitry. Uh, yes, I concur with uh, Mark and Peter, and I think that um, there will be more cognitive capabilities in the RPA, so that it will be able to automate not only like a simple workflow um, processes, but more complex business scenarios, and it will manage maybe unstructured data as an input or natural language or um, Perhaps it will do some data mining and analysis and maybe predictive uh, analysis. And I, I think that uh, all the RPA platforms will have machine learning and AI capabilities, definitely. Thank you, Dmitry. And Sergey, can you sum up? <laughs> well, almost everybody uh, said about some cognitive com capabilities and yes, I agree that would be uh, definitely one of the points. I think another point uh, could be uh, like when software would write its own, uh, write itself on its own. So like I've seen several vendors already uh, uh, well, come to market with a solution when uh, they monitor user actions, they see what uh, are repetitive actions across multiple users, and uh, uh, after that, uh, they provide uh, that information. Uh, and once you have that information, it is very easy to actually write a business process. So that also can be, can be done automatically. So uh, ideally there would be a system which is watching the employees saying, hey, this is something that could be automated and it is automated automatically. Okay, thank you, Sergey. I think this is a topic we could talk about for a long time. Probably we should revisit it later in the year to see how we are getting on. I'd like to thank, um, Mark, Peter, Dmitry, and Sergey, thank you for your time and thank you for your fantastic discussion. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, please keep an eye on our publications, both text and video, and we hope to see you again soon.